In his book titled Tried and Convicted, Michael Cecchini, a Wisconsin criminal defense attorney, argues quite convincingly that fundamental constitutional liberties are under attack by criminal justice practitioners. In the beginning of his book, the author points to a recent case where a prosecutor in Wisconsin petitioned to admit a letter of a deceased person which essentially accused a criminal defendant of murder into evidence during a jury trial. Since the letter was written by someone who had recently passed away, Cicchini contends that the defendant did not have an opportunity to cross-examine or challenge the writer of the letter. According to Cicchini, this case went to the Wisconsin Supreme Court through a special direct appeal and in a crushing blow to the Confrontation Clause of the U.S. Constitution, the court permitted the letter to be admitted into evidence by the lower court. Subsequently, the defendant was convicted, even though he was never permitted to cross-examine the person who had written the letter. After the case, the jury members were polled, and most stated that the letter was the most important piece of evidence that led them to convict the defendant. Throughout his book, Cicchini points to actual cases, such as the one discussed, in order to argue that constitutional liberties are in actuality quite fragile. This is in spite of the fact that the Founding Fathers went to great lengths to prevent citizens from having their rights trampled on by an oppressive government. As we know from history, the Founding Fathers had been oppressed by the British. They wanted to ensure that future generations of Americans would never have to worry about an oppressive government. Nevertheless, the book Tried and Convicted illustrates that law enforcement officials often go to great lengths in order to circumvent and destroy the precious rights that the Founding Fathers worked hard to devise. Of course, it is important to point out that since Cicchini's book provides a critique of the criminal justice system, it is subject to debate. And we will in fact be debating various aspects of the book throughout the upcoming discussion sessions. You might agree with certain aspects of Cicchini's argument, and you may also disagree with certain aspects of his argument. This is what makes his book so interesting in the first place. In one of his, most, uh, his more thought-provoking chapters, Cicchini provides readers with an in-depth discussion of the Fifth Amendment right against self-incrimination. The author argues that, in reality, this is a soft law that is often malleable and manipulated by police officers. In fact, the author maintains that police, with the assistance of prosecutors and judges, have been able to employ numerous techniques in order to avoid reading Miranda warnings to suspects. Cicchini writes that the police, in fact, are very adept at convincing a suspect to waive his or her right to remain silent, as well as the right to an attorney. According to the author, police will often interrogate a suspect before placing the individual under arrest. When this happens, the suspect has not been technically arrested, and therefore law enforcement officers can interview an individual as long as they wish without giving any Miranda warnings. Cicchini argues that police may also approach a suspect um, at work as well as other places where they might be able to catch an individual off guard. In these circumstances, so long as the individual is not placed under arrest, police do not have to give Miranda warnings. This allows them to obtain a self-incriminating statement without having to respect important constitutional liberties. In his book, Cicchini also contends that there are other ways by which law enforcement officials avoid having to Mirandize a suspect. For example, the author asserts that in some cases, police may arrest an individual and place the suspect in custody without making an attempt to perform a formal interrogation. However, instead of asking suspects questions, Cicchini argues that the police may tell certain things to arrestees. According to the author, police do this in the hope of getting some type of verbal reaction. Often, judges may not consider this to be a form of interrogation. Therefore, police are able to obtain incriminating information without having to Mirandize a suspect. However, even if an individual is read his or her Miranda rights, Cicchini contends that the majority of suspects are eventually convinced to waive these rights. The author asserts that often police induce suspects to waive this right by offering false promises. 
They lead suspects to believe that they will be treated with leniency if they cooperate without making any specific guarantees. In his book, Cicchini also makes a convincing argument that the right to privacy is a soft law that is routinely violated by governmental agents. Cicchini explains that it is extremely easy for police officers to obtain warrants. In fact, he suggests that magistrates will almost always give search warrants the rubber stamp of approval. The author argues that search warrants are turned down in only the rarest of cases. Additionally, in a bold indictment of the criminal justice system, Cicchini insinuates that some judges may not even bother to read the warrants they sign off on. He also is critical of the fact that when police officers swear on the truthfulness of statements used in warrants, this is typically done in secret, with no one from the general public actually witnessing this. The author, the author also implies that judges may be reluctant to rule that a warrant is invalid, since this usually means that they may have to rule against a fellow judge and colleague. Also, Cicchini provides a particularly insightful discussion regarding the good faith exception that permits officers to search an individual's home even if a warrant is defective. He asserts that this is among the most dangerous exception to the Constitution, and the author argues that the police are not required to inform homeowners that they have a right to refuse to have their houses searched. As a result of this, he contends that police may simply keep asking to be admitted into a dwelling until the homeowner breaks down and relents to a search. Cicchini asserts that the police often intimidate individuals into allowing them into their houses, and as a result, they may often do they may not even secure a warrant. The author also writes that a police officer may even outright lie and say that a homeowner provided him with consent to search when in fact this was not the case. In what proves to be another extremely insightful chapter, Cicchini explains how criminal defendants may not always enjoy the right to confront their accusers. The author alludes to this in the introduction of his book. However, throughout the book, he delves into this topic in much more detail. For example, Cicchini argues that if a child is a witness to a crime, judges often put constraints on the type of cross-examination that can actually take place during a trial. Also, the author points out that in many cases, police are permitted to read an accuser's written statement that may be admitted as evidence during a criminal trial. While this might appear to be a form of hearsay, judges often allow members of the jury to consider these statements despite the fact that a defendant may not have an opportunity to cross-examine his or her accuser. Cicchini writes accusers may be reluctant to testify for many reasons. For example, the author asserts they may have sobered up since the day of the incident. Also, according to Cicchini, witnesses may be worried about committing perjury particularly if they are unsure of their testimony. Regardless of why a witness may refuse to testify, the author argues that it is problematic when judges admit, admit written statements in lieu of actual witnesses, as this does not give the defense an opportunity to cross-examine adverse witnesses. As you read Cicchini's book, consider whether or not it is permissible for judges to make accommodations for certain types of witnesses. Obviously, if a child is either a victim or a witness to a certain type of crime, it can potentially be traumatic to expose this young person to intense cross-examination and scrutiny from defense attorneys. Nevertheless, though, some scholars, such as Cicchini, might argue that it would be much more traumatic to permit a young person to provide damaging testimony which could be used against a defendant, especially if the testimony is flawed and if the defense is not afforded an opportunity to refute it. It is once again important to mention that our founding fathers went to great lengths to establish a constitutional democracy that would protect individuals from an overly oppressive government. In theory, we all like to believe that American society is free from oppressive governmental agents and that we enjoy fundamental freedoms and liberties that are typically not found in other nations throughout the world. In reality, however, it is plausible that these rights are only an illusion and that they can easily be circumvented by police officers, prosecutors, and judges. This is, by and large, the argument that Cicchini makes throughout his book. 
After reading the book and considering all of the points the author makes, it will then be up to you to decide whether or not you agree with this premise. Cicchini concludes his book by arguing that the criminal justice system provides officials with a perverse incentive to disregard rather than respect constitutional liberties. For example, he writes that if a police officer forces a suspect to confess to a crime, at worst, the prosecution cannot use the incriminating statement at trial. Therefore, the police are no worse off than if they had respected the individual's right to remain silent. And, according to Cicchini, even if the police coerce a suspect to give a statement, any physical evidence discovered as a result of this statement might be able to be used at trial, depending upon the state. The author also contends that it is not uncommon for prosecutors to recklessly file criminal complaints. Cicchini argues that some prosecutors will even overcharge a defendant and use this as leverage to extort a plea bargain agreement. He asserts that police officers also lie in order to justify their actions and contends that both prosecutors and judges are often aware of these lies and accept this as a part of the justice system. Throughout his book, Cicchini argues that Americans should have a healthy distrust of the criminal justice system. As mentioned before, he provides countless examples of how police, prosecutors, and even judges may trample on basic civil rights and liberties. And while many scholars uh, believe that Giacchini makes a fairly convincing case, this book has still stirred up quite a bit of controversy within the discipline of criminal justice. As you reflect upon the book, ask yourself what some of the former or present U.S. Supreme Court justices might have to say about it. For example, what might the recently retired Associate Justice John Paul Stevens have to say about this book? What might the current Chief Justice John Roberts have to say about this book? Are there points that you agree with and are there points that you disagree with? Whether or not you buy into Michael Cicchini's entire argument that our constitutional rights are fragile and often disregarded by criminal justice officials, his book definitely will make you stop and think and it'll help you at, it'll make you ask a, a number of important questions. And this is in fact why I assigned it as part of the required readings for this section of the course.